Is everybody alive and well? Turn to the person beside you and say, wake up, it's New Year's Day. Try the other side, that might help there too. Some of you stayed up late. We do have a breathalyzer at the front door for those who were out a little too late. I, you know, it's been a unique holiday season when you can have Christmas on Sunday and New Year's Day on Sunday. And, I, you know, I just like them do that every year, but for some reason I don't have any clout in that department. But so if y'all could put a few words in, maybe that'd work out. But I just think it's great, great way to start the year is to be in the house of the Lord with God's people, God's family, celebrating Him and giving Him all the glory. Amen? The next Sunday, we're going to start a series of messages called Sync. Now, for those of you with smartphones and tablets and iPads and iPhones and all the other stuff, that'll make more sense to you than, than others. But as you get into the series, it'll hopefully make sense to you as well. Because until uh, you get in sync with God, there's, uh, you haven't been synced yet. So uh, unless you want to be sunk, get synced, all right? We'll talk about that more next Sunday, but I do want to encourage you because we're talking about a lot of particular biblical principles about getting in sync with the Father and getting inside His will, uh, and, uh, you know, just getting your, your life according to His plan versus your plan. So come and we'll be doing the upgrades on Sunday morning, next Sunday, so you won't miss it. Amen? And, you know, looking at starting that Sunday service and those, that series, I really prayed about when to start it and really felt like the Lord may start on the 8th, so uh, it's left me with this gap about Sunday morning and January 1st, and I hate gaps. One of the hardest things I do is not preparing to preach or the preaching, it's deciding what the Lord wants us to preach. And uh, so we wrestle with that, but I really feel like uh, God brought me to this, pa this passage of Scripture for us today is kicking off this year and getting past that resolution to a revolution in our life. I think we need to <clears throat> get back to the point of what re resolution is. I love the old hymn that says, I am resolved no longer to linger, allured by the world's delights. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. In other words, the things that ought to catch our sight are the things that are a lot more noble than what the world tends to offer us. Amen? So we're going to be looking at a passage of Scripture, and we're going to be talking about the way forward, because it's important as we get into this year that we're moving in the right direction and moving according to the right plan. So let's talk about that today. And there was one Scripture that I've come back to a lot in my own personal walk, my own personal relationship with Jesus over the years. It always goes back to Hebrews chapter 11 and chapter 12. Those are great places in the Word of God. And Hebrews chapter 11, he's talking about those heroes of faith, those people who endured despite all the odds against them. They kept on going strong, and God wrote them down in the book for us to remember that, that, that we can live a life of faith and be, should be challenging to us. But in Hebrews chapter 12, he gets into these verses 1 through 3. And remember that uh, when this was written, it wasn't broken up in verses and chapters. It's just one flowing passage of Scripture. So he's talking about in the light of all those people who've gone on before. And he says, Therefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. And let me just stop there for a moment because I've heard a lot of preachers over the years preach from this passage and say something really, I guess the simplest word comes is just stupid, okay? Okay. Uh, I can't use that word in front of my granddaughter, so if your grandchildren are in the room, your children, that's a bad word, Pastor Joe, repent at the service, okay? But <laughs> it just really is kind of dumb when you think about it, and they, they preach it like this. There's all our friends and loved ones who've gone on to with the Lord are watching us. Friends, they've got far better things to do than be watching us, all right? Last thing I want to do is heaven is look back down here. It's, it, the idea here is not that somebody's around there and it's, it's not like going to the Texans game and cheering on the, the team on the field. The idea here is that these people, chapter 11, they have walked with God, they've witnessed the power of God, they've witnessed the hand of God, they've seen that the Word of God is in fact true. You can stand on it, you can believe it, and God is faithful. That's, they're giving testimony. It's not like they're witnessing us. They've witnessed what God can do. So he's not talking about the context of people standing around cheering us on. We, we have the Lord to do that. We have the Holy Spirit in us, all right? That the great encourager and the great comforter lives in us. So the idea here is that these people can bear witness that God is faithful and God is true. So in the light of that witness, he said, we should lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Great passage, a great encouragement from the Word of God that talks about 
how we should be moving forward and the things that should be the focus of our life. In fact, in looking at this, just, just kind of sitting at my desk at the, at the house uh, about a week ago or so, the Lord was really speaking this word to me and several key phrases came out of that passage to me for my own walk as I was reading it for my own self. One was, let go. And then he talks about the things we hold on. And the third element of the message today is to look. And that, those three things are the things that kind of popped out of this verse and were for me personally in my own walk with God, I thought it would be certainly an encouragement to you. And sometimes that's where the sermons come from, what the Lord is saying to me and how God's working in my life. So I've got plenty of sermon materials, lest you think I'm always preaching about you. All right, sometimes I'm stepping on my own toes. So, but the idea here is that the Lord has a word for us. We're looking down the road and should the Lord delay us coming and we go through 2012, you know, uh, there's some tremendous words that God has for us. Now, should we not make it to 2013? Maybe you're a Mayan, we won't get past this. So let me get step up. Okay. That is a joke, okay? <laughs> Mayans believe the calendar year ends on 12, 21, 2012. All right, and that the whole world's gonna face massive destruction, everything's obliterated, everything goes into annihilation. All right, back to the sermon. Anyway, <laughs> chuckle a little bit, I'll feel better about it. But anyway, as you get back to this whole idea, as we go forward with this year, there's going to be challenges, there's going to be difficulties. I was in the car this morning on the way to the Magnolia campus early and was listening to a preacher on the radio and he was talking about, the, I think his last name is Cuppinger, he was kind of quoting from a book this lady had written, and she was talking about all the crisis, the difficulties of her life, the loss of loved ones, her husband had passed away, and difficulty had come, and they faced diabetes, critical diabetes for years, and the fight that they'd fought and all the different problems and she was diagnosed with the cancer later on and all the problems that she had dealt with and she said there's some lessons I've learned from this and one is you know about not giving up but you know she said you don't always have to like it I thought that was a good lesson to learn that we don't always have to like what we're going through uh, the Bible doesn't say be be thankful for everything it says be thankful in everything all right in everything give thanks it doesn't necessarily we have to appreciate it, it doesn't mean you know, that God's mad at us even. So the idea is that we're going to face problems and there's going to be crisis, whether it's right now or six months from now or tomorrow, there'll be difficulties. Just as there were in 2011, there's nothing magical when the clock hits, moves from 1231 to, to 101 that, that happens. And, and I know it's a time we kind of mark on the calendar and we kind of look at our lives and it's review, introspection, inspection, uh, you know, rejection, whatever it might be. And we kind of look and we start talking about our lives and where we've been, where we're going. But I do believe that the Word of God does give us some markers in our life, but there should always be this when we come to realizing that, hey, with Christ and through the blood of Jesus and because of His promise to us, we can have a start. We can, number one, be saved and become a new creation. And number two, we can have revival in our life if we're sluggish and dead in our spiritual walk. Number three, we can have forgiveness over sin in our life. Praise the Lord. And that's really the first issue he deals with. And he says, listen, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And I know, and you know as well, that sin certainly easily besets us. Whenever we choose to rebel against God, to reject God in some area of our life, choose our own will, go our own way, and it's an easy thing to do. I don't have to struggle to sin. Now you're saying amen for me or for you, I don't know. It's not a big struggle. It comes naturally, it comes easily because as Paul said, you know, it's in my flesh. The old man versus the new man of Romans chapter 7. But I, here's the important part I want you to catch this morning. Should you be making some resolution? Should you have some resolve or some commitment to, I want to walk with God this year. Or I want to be drawn nigh to Him. I want to spend more time. I want to be a better man, a better woman, whatever God's dealing with you about today. First of all, you're going to have to deal with this particular issue. Let us lay aside the weight, the sin that easily besets us. There's certainly weights that we can carry, but the greatest weight of all you will carry and you will have difficulty in moving forward in is this area called sin. If there's some area of your life that's not right with God, you're not going to succeed in any real way. You may find some measure of humanity that says that's success, but you know deep in your heart of hearts that things don't bring success here in the heart, in your life. It's a walk with God. It's a right relationship. It's a clear conscience. It's sins forgiven. It's freedom from shame and freedom from guilt. That's genuine success. And there's a lot of people with lots of money who are piled on with all kinds of burdens of sin and shame and guilt. All those things are bearing down their life. But real freedom and real success is can, comes in knowing that your sins are forgiven. 
you've never given your life to Christ, first and foremost, you need to get your life, your heart right with God. Jesus said, I've come to set you free and I'll set you free indeed. Real freedom comes from knowing Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Not religion, not being a Baptist, Methodist, Catholic, or whatever, but really coming to a place in your heart and life where you have a relationship with Christ. That comes from dealing with this issue of sin. What is it? It's the willingness to put yourself first is what it really gets done. I want what I want, when I want, how I want it, whatever way I want it. That's what it boils down to. That's the essence of all that our sin is. So he's saying you lay this aside. Give your heart and your life to Christ. At the cross, Jesus Christ paid the price for your sin. He died your death. He paid your price. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Get your heart right with God. If you're not right with God, he'll make you a new person. Because if any man is in Christ, he's a new creation. Now, if you're a Christian, you already know the Lord, and this weight is in your life, and this sin in your life, you're not going to walk with God and carry this sin. It's just not going to happen. I know that there's this mindset, and we've kind of got this, uh, this little wall that goes up, and the, the culture has told us about separation of church and separation of state, you know, that what you are at work or school can be different than what you are at church and kind of got this dual identity thing going on. Well, that doesn't work in the spiritual realm and spiritual life. You can't be two different people. The Bible calls that hypocrisy. You're going to live your life in Christ and be what God's called you to be, or are you going to live it in the flesh? I mean, I, I, this is as positive as I can get about this, folks. It's either in or out, you know, paint or get off the ladder kind of mindset here. You're going to have to get right with God. Uh, I like the old bumper sticker that says, get right with God, get right or get left. Amen? And I think that's the way it really boils down to in our, our spiritual life and in our walk. Don't begin to assume that you can embrace that which is against God's will, that which you know is sin in your life, and still be right with God. It is not possible. There's no place in Scripture that even kind of refers or infers or alludes to that in any shape, form, or fashion. The Bible says repent. It's called us to a place of getting our hearts right. Here's the good thing about it, that when I am convicted about my sin, I don't have to wallow in my, in, 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 in my guilt and my shame and wallow around like some pig in the, in, the, in the pen down there. I can get right with God. I can confess my sin. I can lay aside the weight and the sin that easily besets me, and now I can run. But you can't run, and you can't move forward as long as there's this heavy weight and this burden, this bondage of sin. You'll always be intimidated. You'll always be condemned. You'll always feel guilty. The shame will stay there. But I have a great solution for your resolution, and that's come to the cross. Get right with God. Let us lay aside the sin that easily besets us. I, I remember preaching a, a sermon, uh, and I even stole the outline because not everything's original. In fact, the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. But I remember a sermon I preached years ago that I'd gotten from somebody, another evangelist friend of mine. He preached it on Samson, and it was about Samson's sin. And these were the three points. He said, you know, sin will take you further than you want to go. And by the way, not in the direction you want to go either. It'll not only take you further than you want to go, it'll keep you longer than you're willing to stay because there's bondage in it. But not only will it keep you along and you want to stay, it'll cost you more than you're willing to pay. And that's so true. You know, the, 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 with all the recession and all the economic chaos, there's one thing that has not been affected by the depression or the recession or the economic downturn. It is the high cost of sin. It still is death. It still destroys. It still brings division. And we know the word death never means to just be annihilated and not exist anymore. It means to be separated from. Sin always brings separation in our hearts from God and our relationships with other people and our homes and our relationship to our children, our husband, our wife. Sin always divides. It is the great divider. But again, stop for a moment and thank God for the cross of Jesus because we have the answer to deal with our sin. We can come to Christ. He still forgives. He still cleanses. The blood of Jesus is still powerful today. Amen. And amen. So the first thing is do let go. The second thing for this year is hold on. And there's a couple of things I want to mention here under hold on. First of all, hold on to the Word of God. Love what Paul told Timothy. And he said, hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. One of the things you're going to have to embrace this year if you're going to move forward is the truth of God's Word. You're going to have to hold on to it. You're going to have to believe it. You're going to have to receive it. You're going to have to follow it. You're going to have to trust it. This is your manual for life, basically. This is how it operates. You want to know how to get down the road? Follow the map. And this is God's map for us. But more than just an instruction, God empowers our life. 
And talking a little bit, we go back to that sin issue. The way to have victory over your sin is through the Word. It's through the Word that we know that we're forgiven and cleansed. So I obey the Word by repentance and faith. You say, oh, Brother Joe, I, I've done that, but I still have this stronghold in my life that I can't seem to let go of that. Get into the Word of God. Embrace the Word of God. Memorize the Word of God. Nothing breaks the chains of sin more, more powerfully than the blood of Jesus and the Word of God. So I always encourage people who are dealing with some habitual sin in their life and they seem to be in bondage to is to memorize the Scripture. Begin to memorize or be specific in your memory verses. Find verses that are related to your need. Write them down on cards. Put them in your pocket. Memorize them. Just everywhere you go during the day, recall them into your mind and work on them. Receive them. Absorb them. You say, well, I'm, I'm doing that, but I'm still struggling. Well, let me give you another, another, another one last solution here. You're still struggling? Try this. As you pray and as you read the Word, as you memorize the Word, fast. Take a day, take two days, take one day a week where you're going to fast and you're going to lay this very thing before God and you're going to ask God to break the chains that are in your life. There's still a power that God brings into our life as a result of our disciplined fasting. The scripture has a great deal to say about it. We've talked about fasting in the past. If you want more information on it, just request a tape or CD on fasting from, from a, the table back there. So there's some request forms and learn what it means to fast. Break those chains. But as you do it, this is where the Word of God becomes so much more powerful in our life. So hold on to the Word of God. Don't let anything override the truth of this verse. Why do we hold on to it? Because it will never fail. And why will it never fail? Because He will never fail. It's His Word. If God is powerful, His Word is everything He is. He is powerful. You can hold on to the Word of God. But also hold on in this regard. Hold on to commitment. Hold on to your faith. Jesus, in speaking to the churches as he's moving among the lampstands of the book of Revelation, says these words, hold fast until I come. If there's any word that ought to be a strong word for you as you approach this year, it ought to be that one. I am going to hold fast. That's talking about commitment. Let me give you a different word even. It's talking about tenacity. I'm just going to be dogged in my determination. I'm not going to let anything steal my blessed hope, my joy, my victory. I am going to hold on. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to believe God no matter what comes. I'm not going to let go. I love Hebrews 12. This verse says, this is where we talk about what it means to hold on. For consider him that endured such contradictions of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. Just the time you think that it couldn't get any worse, or I'm the only person going through this, or this is so hard, or I don't know if I can take another day, look unto Jesus. Consider Him, lest you be worried. When you think about quitting, thank God that Jesus didn't. When you think about bailing out because it's just too tough, and what they're saying is too hard, remember Christ. Go back to the cross and remember everything that He did for you. The Scripture says, you have not yet resisted unto blood, how many any of you in here can say, hey, I have resisted the devil and I've resisted the, the temptation and this world to the point of shedding blood? Not too many of us, amen, can actually say that. It hadn't cost us a lot in regard. The Bible says when you think the cost is high and you really want to see how high the cost is, look back to the cross. But it's more than just looking at the cost he paid, you're considering Jesus Christ. He's the source. He's the author, we said a while ago, and the finisher. You hold on no matter what it takes. Don't give up. Don't let up. Don't shut up till you get taken up. Amen. Keep holding on to Christ. Whatever it means and whatever that takes, you do it. But also, one other element, and I mentioned this briefly in my little four-minute sermon Sunday last week, is you hold on to each other. This is what John says. This is the message which you heard from the beginning, that you should love one another. Now, remember the context of that not broken up chapters and verses. He's talking about the love of God and the fellowship that we can have with God. He said, listen, God, God has shown us this. We want to show you this. God's called us to fellowship. We want to tell you about this so you can have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship was with the Father. We're going to hold on to Jesus Christ and we're going to hold on to you. This is so important. So many times we're, we're prone to let people go. We're prone to just let it go. By. It's difficult in dealing with a person. Or it's difficult in dealing with them. There are times when, yes, we have to maybe separate ourselves from someone because of an influence factor or as a parent because a child is being disciplined or something. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about in the long term, even though we may, as a church, we have gone through church discipline with somebody, we don't quit on people. 
We still continue to believe God for them. We still continue to love them. We still continue to lift them up in prayer. We may not be fellowshipping with them, but we're still holding on to them as a child of God and as a family of God, believing God to touch their heart and their life. There are difficult crises and decisions that come at all times in our life. But ultimately, the message is still the same. God has called us to love one another just as we have been loved. And that means the point of grace, that means the point of forgiveness, that means the point of acceptance and receiving people. We're going to trust God and we're going to believe God and we're going to hold on. But I don't know just to, to hold on to each other. I think part of this is, uh, is that we hold each other accountable. It's all right if you have a Christian brother or sister and you know they're struggling or failing or getting ready to bail out on God to go to them and say, listen, I want to encourage you. I want to tell you not to give up. I want to tell you not to quit. I want to hold you accountable. I'm praying for you. Don't bail out on God. Don't bail out on Jesus. Don't bail out on the church. Keep trusting God. So when, to hold each other, it's, it's, it's sometimes in the difficult situations. We, in fact, we can't pick and choose who we're going to hold and not hold in this regard. Amen? It's not a pick and choose thing. Well, someone's easy. I'll do that. That was not easy. That person's easy to get along with. I'll, they'll, you know, I'll, I'll love and befriend them. That person, you know, they're difficult. And they're probably difficult because they're a lot like you. <laughs> Amen. Isn't that what usually happens if the truth were known? And I can, I can guarantee you folks, that it's easy to see a sin in somebody else. It's very easy to pick that out in them if it's in you already. The Bible says, Thou which judgest another, judgest not thyself also. In other words, I believe the context of that is, it's really easy for me to see something in somebody else and not be willing to judge it in my own life, be willing to judge somebody else though. Don't be hypocritical. Be humble and hold on. Hold on to your faith, your commitment to the Word of God. Hold on to the body of Christ and to each other. And the last point, which also has a couple of key points under it, is look. First of all, look up. Back to chapter 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus. Why? Because He started it. He's the author. How's it going to finish? That's how you're going to get to the end. You're not going to make it without Him. You must, in all situations, at all times, throughout your life, throughout this year, throughout the days ahead of you, you have to keep your eyes on Christ. It's easy to start looking at people, and you get very disappointed. You look at me, I'll disappoint you. You look across the room, someone will disappoint you. Your husband will disappoint you. Your wife will disappoint you. Your kids will disappoint you. Your, your boss will disappoint you. But that's not who we're looking at, is it? We're looking unto Jesus. He's the standard. He's the one we love. He's the one we go by. So we look unto Jesus. So keep your eyes up. Keep looking unto Christ because there will be a lot of things that will seek to draw your attention away from Him. This is a discipline. It's a commitment you have to make. I will look to Christ and I will spend time with Christ. I'll be with Him. Another part of this looking has to do with looking out. The Bible says be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking someone whom he may divide. This talks about being discerning. As we look up to the Lord and this is where God, we look to Him, He'll give us this discernment. We also have to look out. He talks about this contradiction of sinners against you. You know, that, that, that thing's happening, it's going on. There's a world that is opposed to the way I live. There's a world system that's opposed to the way you live. There's a philosophy in the world that's opposed to the, the theology of Scripture that you embrace. In fact, there's many times if you choose to be what God's called you to be and choose to stand on it, that you will be rejected by those around you, all right? But you keep your eyes on Christ. But also, those, aren't, those are the obvious things. There's some things that are not so obvious. The Bible tells us, you know, that we need to be sober. We need to be vigilant. Why? Because we have an adversary. The Apostle Paul says we are not ignorant of his devices. The word literally, his methods. We're not ignorant of Satan's methods. He's very methodical. Now, now for you that are first-time guests, I'm not saying the devil's a Methodist, okay? I'm just... <laughs> I'm saying that he is very methodical. He has a method which by the way he works. He knows where you're vulnerable. Do you? Do you know where your weaknesses are? You should know and you should be aware where your weaknesses are and don't put yourself in situations. You have to be vigilant. You have to be discerning. You've heard me say it before. If you're on a diet, you can't sit in the kitchen and stare at the refrigerator. You're not going to stay on your diet. All right? You're going to mess up every time. Be sober. Be on guard. You have an enemy. He's laying traps. You are his enemy. Well, I, I, I don't want to be in a war. You are in a war. And you'll either walk in victory and fire your shots where they need to be fired, or you will be fired upon constantly. You'll lower your weapons, and you'll be taken a prisoner of war. And I don't want to be a prisoner of war, amen? So we look out. We look up. We make sure that we're aware of what's going on around us. The Bible says in Proverbs that the prudent man foresees the evil and he prepares himself. In other words, I know 
how Satan works. I know how he works in my life. Been doing this a little while now, I ought to know, amen? So since I know how he works, then I need to be prepared. And if I'm going to be discerning or smart or prudent, as the scripture says, then I will be discerning. I'll be vigilant. I will be on guard against my adversary. But we not only look up, we look out, we also look ahead. Listen to the words of Jesus. He says, and these things come to pass, then look up and lift up your head, your redemption draweth nigh. Great words. Remember the context here is Jesus has just laid out the end time scenario. Things are going to get bad. Things go from worse to worse. Sin abounds. Grace and glory can continue to abound on a greater level. But hey, we're going to, we live in a world I don't have a lot of great expectations for. I really don't believe that whatever government replaces the next government, whatever party's ruling in the Middle East, whatever, is going to change a lot of stuff, all right? Jesus is still coming back. The world is still going to go to hell in this proverbial handbag. Things are going to get bad. Antichrist is coming on the scene. You know, things are going to get worse. That's just going to happen. Am I weary and dreary and sad and forlorn? No, I am happy and excited because Jesus is coming back and I'm not going to get frustrated because that all this would happen. Amen. So I'm going to look ahead. Jesus said, when you see these things, the next verse we think would say, oh, just put your head in between your shoulders and say, that's terrible. <laughs> no, when you see these things come to pass, lift up your heads, your redemption draweth nigh. This could well be the Lord's return year. It really could be, amen? This could be the season that the Lord returns. I don't know, all right? But I do know that it's coming. Paul said we're in the last days. Certainly, these must be the last seconds. Jesus is coming again, and he's coming to a world that is described in Scripture of what it would be like. And that is certainly an accurate picture of where we are today, what those prophets long ago wrote. I believe he's coming soon. I believe he's coming. You say, well, Brother Joe, people been saying a long time. I, I, I know, I, I hear a lot. My wife was leaving the other day to go shopping. And, and sometimes when she disappears, for you see, tell me she'll be back in 45 minutes an hour. You know, you know, wives in stores and how that goes sometimes. I said, well, honey, when are you coming back? Oh, I'm coming back soon. I said, Jesus said that and it's been 2,500 years. <laughs> so when do you think you're coming back? He is coming back. And for anybody to say, well, he's always been saying that, well, in reality, you are a biblical prophetic fulfillment. Because when you read in First and Second Peter, he talks about that in the end times. And one verse says something like this. Our forefathers told us that he'd return and he hasn't come back soon. He hasn't come back yet. The Bible says in the end times, it will be the same way. People will be saying the same thing. It'll get to the point where people say, oh, it's been a long time now, so maybe he's not coming back. Jesus said, that's I'm getting very near at that point. We're at that point. But we could go into all those prophetic hundreds of verses of scriptures that describe the seasons and the times and the days, and we would see that we are right in that season and right in that time, and that day is coming very, very soon. It could, it could be today. And we always ought to be living with that attitude and that mindset of looking ahead. Jesus is coming, lifting up my head. Redemption is drawn now. And I need to be living in a way that will glorify him and honor him. So if he came today, I am excited and praising the Lord and rejoicing. If he comes back next year, I'm still excited and praising and rejoicing. But I'm prepared for if it's 10 years from now, 100 years from now, or 10 seconds from now. I live my life prepared. Look up. Your redemption draws now. You want to know the way forward through this year? This is, this is what it gets down to. You let go. You release some things. You let go of sin. You let go of the past failures. You let go of the mess up. He's covered it. He's forgotten it. It's time to move forward. You hold on. You hold on to the things that are precious. You hold on to the Word. You hold on to your commitment. Have a tenacity. Of, I'm not letting go of God this year. I'm not backing up. I'm not selling out. I'm not going to compromise. I'm holding on to my commitment. And I'm holding on to my brothers and my sisters in Christ. I'm going forward with them. I may have to drag some of them, but I'm going forward with them. I'm also believing that I'm looking to Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of my faith, and I'm expecting him to be everything I need in my life. I am looking up. I'm realizing that I'm living in a dangerous world, so I'm looking out around me. I'm also lifting up my head and looking unto Jesus, looking ahead to his return, because it could be today. Amen? That's the way that we move forward. I am hoping and praying that's the way that you embrace to move forward in this year. And I believe that we can all turn around to the end of 2012 and say, my, wasn't God good? We saw what God did. But get rid of the extra luggage, folks. It's not worth dragging around behind you because you can't walk with God and carry it. Get right with God. Would you stand with your heads bowed?
And I, let me reiterate one thing. This